Great. Um, thanks everybody for coming to my talk today. My name is Maeve Upton and um, my title for this talk is Irish Sea Level Change in the Atlantic Context. So my two supervisors are Professor Andrew Purnell and Dr. Neve Cahill from the Maths and Stats Department and the Hamilton Institute. So um, I'm going to just give a quick um, start. So this is what I'm going to try and talk about today. Firstly, do a quick recap on global warming um, that we're all probably used to have heard a lot about at the moment. Then I'm going to talk about my research group, the A4 project. Then I'm going to give a definition of what relative sea level change is and how data is collected for um, this. Then I'm going to do a little bit about statistics, my Bayesian linear regression modeling and um, Gaussian processing modeling, and then I'll sum up with a quick summary at the end. So um, that being said, I just give it a good start. Um, I know this is not a very nice um, quote to start with, but I think it is important. For right now, we are facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years climate change. And I think Sir David Attenborough said this in, I think it was probably Blue Planet, it is highlighting the real challenge that we have to make and the changes that we have to do in the next couple of years so that we can protect the climate for the future. Okay, so um, we shall do a quick recap on the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect, we have solar radiation reaches the Earth's atmosphere and some is reflected back out to space. So this is a natural process that happens every day. The next thing is this sun's energy is absorbed by the land and oceans and heats our Earth, keeping us nice and toasty. Then some of this heat is radiated from the Earth back out towards space. But on its way out to space, some of this heat is trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, keeping Earth warm enough to sustain life. So that's like a little blanket. But human activities such as burning fossil fuels and agriculture is increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. As a result, extra heat is trapped in our atmosphere, causing our Earth temperatures to rise. And I know today, we're feeling a little bit chilly outside and some people think that, oh, I won't mind a little bit of warmth, but we've all seen the impacts of global warming across the globe. We've seen the ice caps melting, we've seen the bushfires over in Australia last year and the destruction they caused. We've seen the drought in different parts of the globe, but here in Ireland we've seen the increase of storms and the increases in sea level and coastal flooding. That being said, where is this global warming going to? Where is this extra heat? Well, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. And no surprise that 93% of this extra heat is going into our oceans. Our oceans are extremely important for our climate, they interact with our atmosphere and they also interact with our coastlines. So they have a huge impact on our lives. Therefore, I'm part of the A4 project. And the A4 project, A4, it's, it seems a little bit weird, but A stands for four A's. Egan, Eroj, August, Ahru, Atlantic. Oceans, climate and Atlantic change. And this is a two million five year award funded by the Marine Institute and the European Regional Development Fund. So we will be examining three different areas of physical oceanography and climate research. So work package one is looking at understanding Atlantic variability and its connection to the Irish shelf. So this will be looking at um, our Gulf Stream and ocean circulation systems that keep Ireland nice and have a mild climate. The second work package and the work package that I'm involved in is advancing Irish sea level change in the Atlantic context. So in the past, this has been really understudied in Ireland, which is a bit worrying because 
40% of our population is within five kilometers of um, our coastline. So this is vital for understanding what happened in the past to make better predictions for our future sea level change. And the final work package is developing predictive capabilities on a decadal timescales. So this is going to be really important looking at the atmosphere and how it relates to our oceans so that we can assist in um, helping our local authorities with planning and management with, for our climate in the future. Okay, so this is our team. Um, I think I'm missing one or two people that just started, but it's really nice. We have a really diverse background and lots of different skills. Um, I won't go through all the names, but um, we all come from lots of different backgrounds and um, it's really nice to work with lots of different experiences and the lots of different research fields. So keep an eye out for these people. They'll be showing results in the next coming years. Great. So let's start off with sea level change. So I think everybody has heard of sea level change, but sea level is a powerful example of climate change. And you've probably heard about global mean sea level. So this is our average level of sea surface. And this is what's quoted in the media. It is rising and it's accelerating. It's really dependent on greenhouse emission trajectory. And this, I'll talk about this plot here. This plot comes from IPCC report. IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Con Climate Change. So these reports are released every couple of years and they're like our benchmark. They're our highest standard. They're the collection of best research that's been carried out for climate change in Ireland and across um, the world. So this plot represents two scenarios. We have our blue scenario, which is our low emission scenario, and we have a red scenario, which is their high emission scenario. Ideally, we should be aiming for the low scenario. And you can see that if we can make changes today, it will have a huge impact on keeping our atmosphere at a um, and our balance of global warming, reducing global warming and keep this global mean sea level rise at a sort of stable period. But on the flip side, if we don't make changes today, we could be facing a scenario which is represented by the projected sea level rise in red. So this is highlighting how important changes that we make today could impact our future. So another reason why is rates of sea level rise has risen from one to two millimeters per year in most re regions over the past century to rates of three to four millimeters per year. And I'm just going to show you a quick example of what an, a rise in sea level could impact. This is an island in Indonesia. This is um, central Java for those of, who have visited. It is a small island and this is the coastline, this little plot up here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, in 2003, this was the coastline. It supported 200 families um, with their agricultural lands. Fast forward to 2019, in just a few years, the coast has moved over two kilometers. So this was a report carried out in 2020 by BBC, and it highlighted the impacts of a rising sea level now there is only one family that is left because in 2005 they began to relocate the um, villagers off this location but it just highlights the real impact that we could face with rising sea level if changes are not made. Let's talk about Ireland. These are two reports that were done last year by Kevin O'Sullivan in the Irish Times. So um, Irish sea level rise could double extreme coastal flooding events every five years. That's one report he did. And a more recent one will be um, 70,000 Irish addresses at risk of coastal flooding by 2050. So this article was based on actually um, a website uh, which is called Climate Set Central. And Climate Central is a non-profit organization of leading scientists and journalists who research and report climate change. So this is a plot of 
Dublin. And this is sort of a prediction of Dublin in 2050. Say hello to the island of Hoth. So in red, you can see what the potential sea level rise, coastal flooding that could occur by 2050. So you can see that lots of parts of Dublin city centre, the separation of Hoth from the mainland, um, the impact on Port Marnock and even up further north. So this is what the sea level rise could, um, how it could affect our capital. Another location in Ireland that I just wanted to highlight was Limerick. So Limerick is at the mouth of the River Shannon and you can see that it will also be impacted hugely with coastal flooding and a rise in sea level. So again, the red is what these predictions from these leading scientists have carried out. And if you want to go and visit this website, it's climatecentral.org. It's really um, useful and it gives a very nice um, uh, sort of visualization of climate uh, changes in different components of like sea level. Um, and it's an sort of interactive as well. So they also give links to the academic papers that relates to these research if you wanted more in depth. So I just wanted to highlight what the impacts of rising sea level could be on Ireland. Okay. That being said, uh, let's talk about a definition for relative sea level change. Okay. So relative sea level change is what we measure. If we're standing on the surface of, uh, if you're standing at in the beach, what you see is actually relative sea level. It's very hard for us standing on the sea to measure the exact height of the sea surface. So we need to have something like a reference frame to relate it back to. So in this case, we have relative sea level, and this is simply the difference between a sea surface and our earth sediment surface. So relative sea level, I'm gonna talk about how we collect the data for this in a second, but I wanted to highlight that relative sea level changes are part of a complex pattern of interactions. And these interactions all vary with different time scales and they change spatially. So in different locations, they might have different factors that increase or decrease relative sea level change. And these are the first, these are like five main ones that I worry about in my research. The first one would be isostatic influence. So this means that if you have glaciers on the land, they begin to melt. What's happening? We're delivering more fresh water into our oceans, so our sea level will rise. That's the first factor of relative sea level change. The second factor would be asteric expansion. Simply, if you have a body of water and you heat it, it expands. So uh, we know that our globe is warming, so our oceans are being heated and they are expanding. So as a result, our relative sea level is going to increase. The next factor is tectonics factors. And this is something that we don't worry about too much in Ireland because we don't have uh, active plate boundaries. Um, but in other parts of the globe, they can have a huge impact on relative sea level change. So if you have two plates and they collide, one is going to subduct under the other and the upper plate is going to uplift. As a result, our relative sea level will actually appear to fall. Because if you think about it, if you have your ruler that's measuring your height of your sea surface on the land and your land is vertically moving upwards, your relative sea level will actually appear to fall. So that's another factor for our relative sea level change. The next factor that we worry about and actually has impacted Ireland is glacial isostatic adjustment. And I know it's such a, it's a big word and I struggled for a long time to say it, but um, it's related to, if you have like a, a large glacier on your plate, it causes a depression. So it's putting a huge mass load on your plate. 
As a result, our relative sea level will actually appear to rise because this plate is pushing down on our plate and it's making our sea appear to be higher. But then on the flip side, if this glacier begins to melt, our plate will rebound. So this um, depression will now become an uplift. And as a result, our relative sea level will actually appear to fall. So this is a little bit of a weird one to think about, but it has impacted Ireland because I think about 10,000 years ago, Ireland was actually covered in a glacier. So now we're still feeling the effects of a rebounding plate even to this day. And the last factor that I worry about is let's say local factors. This could be increased sediment delivery and this causes our raising of our ocean floors. So our relative sea level will appear to rise. So all these contributing factors to relative sea level, they all vary across the globe. So we know that some places have more influence uh, and they also vary in time. So down through history, different uh, factors have had a larger influence than others. That being said, how are we going to collect data to examine this? So data collection for historic sea level change. We have three main methods. Our first method is by satellite. So satellites um, use radar to measure the actual height of the ocean surface. And they do this really precisely and um, they do it all around the globe. However, there's one snag with that. They've only been around maybe 25 years. So the records are not very long. Second way to collect relative sea level change data is by tidal gauges. So tidal gauges measures the sea, the tides, using a fixed point on the land. So you may have seen if you live beside a pier or you may have seen those like, they're like rulers, I, I call them rulers, but there is a lot more modern ones out there as well. And they measure the, the height of the tide. In Ireland, I don't know if you can see this plot, but you can there is red dots all around Ireland. These are the different tide gauges around Ireland um, that man monitor the tides. They are run by the Marine Institute, but I think this plot is a little bit old. There's actually a, a good few more now that are run by the Office of Public Works as well. So they're doing a really good job. However, another snag is that they only are around maybe 150 years. And the further back we go, the more patchy the data becomes. So we needed another option. And this is where my collaborators from Trinity College Dublin come in. They are fantastic at using proxy records. So proxy records um, come from taking cores from salt marshes. And when we take these cores, um, what we can get is we can get sort of like a, um, see how our sea level has changed because salt marshes are really good at keeping up with uh, changes in sea level because they accumulate, accumulate at the same rate as our sea level changes. And then within these salt cores, we can find fossils of organisms like Foraminifera, who we can, radiocarbon dating techniques can give us an idea of historic sea level because we know that certain organisms like to live at certain depths in the ocean. So it's really useful technique. It also has overcome our issue with um, how, how far back. They can provide us insights into um, data for maybe every five, like 500 years. So this is a lot better than our other two methods. And this plot here shows us the distribution of Irish um, salt marshes and two thirds of those are along the west coast. So my collaborators will hopefully get out back out into the field and um, start collecting Irish proxy records and help us figure out, bridge this gap in Irish historical sea level change. And this is just another plot to highlight the importance of our methods of data collection. We have our satellites only been around for maybe 20, 25 years. We have our tidal gauges, which are probably about maybe 100 and 150 years. But as you can see, they get a little bit patchier the further we go back. 
But then we have our geological reconstructions and our salt marsh reconstructions fill in this gap. So these are the three methods of data collection and this is what's helping us um, examine how relative sea level has changed along um, in Ireland, but also other parts of the globe. Okay, now we're going to talk a bit about statistics and I promise, I know it's a Monday afternoon, I promise I won't go too, too statsy on you guys today. Um, so now we're developing models for rates of sea level change. And I'm going to start off with a quote. Um, All models are wrong, but some are useful. This was said by George Box, who was a famous statistician. So the idea of what we're trying to do is look at our trend of our sea level and use our data, but also make it helpful, help it along with our statistics. So the statistics I use is Bayesian statistics. And if you've never heard of them, don't worry about it. Um, they're extremely useful and they have three different components that we need. We need a likelihood, we need the data, which comes from our salt marshes, and we need some prior. These three components form um, our Bayes theorem. And Bayes theorem is, um, uses probability to represent all different parts of a statistical model. So let's say we have an unknown parameter that we want to estimate. Let's say in our case, we want to estimate um, the mean trend of our sea level throughout a couple of years. We can obtain estimates for this parameter using Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem says that our unknown parameter, the probability of estimating our unknown parameter conditioned on the data is proportional to some likelihood function times some prior. And you might be asking, what did she on about this prior? Well, all this prior is, is like we have a, a guess. So we guess what the parameter should look like or this unknown distribution should look like. These priors can be informative or they can be uninformative. We can use, if they're informative, we can pull from different studies. So if we knew that somebody else has studied this site, we could pull information from their study to help inform our models. And then through Bayesian theorem, we can obtain posterior distributions. And this is what is giving us estimates for our relative sea level through the years. And from these posteriors, we can sample them to get our estimates for our unknown parameters. Okay, so these are our model considerations, our Bayesian statistics. Next, we need to talk about our techniques. So I was sort of mentioning this in the last slide, sea level models range from something that's completely statistical to something entirely physical. So we're trying to look for a Goldilocks zone here. We can either have one option where we use a statistical model that the priors um, are simply uninformative and we are looking at relative sea level at different locations just based on how close they are in time and space. That's one option. Another option is to use physical models. So we're examining um, our sea level using deterministic models and this is sort of using physics equations to um, formulate the trend. But the third one and the one I like to use is a blended boat, is my Goldilocks. The goal is um, a blended boat. So we use our statistical basis and also our physical models. And to do that, we use these priors, these guesses that, and we get these guesses from, let's say, our physical model. And we can pull in information from our physical model into our statistical basis. That being said, you might be like, why? Why bother using Bayesian statistics for estimating sea level rates of change? Well, the first advantage is that Bayesian models are flexible and they're capable of solving more complex models such as relative sea level rates of change. The second advantage is that it provides parameter estimates conditioned on the data without making any assumptions. And this is extremely useful for rates of relative sea level change, because in many cases, we don't know what the distribution will look like. It's, um, it's a real, it's something we don't know. 
Another advantage would be Bayesian statistics incorporates our prior information about an unknown parameter within our Bayesian framework. And that's what I was saying, and that's what I kept ramping on about. We can pull in information from different components, different physical models, in through that idea of a prior. So these priors are extremely useful for helping to inform our models. And the last advantage for Bayesian statistics is that when calculating relative sea level rates to change, we need to account for uncertainty because at the very start of my stats section, I said that models are useful. They're not, all, they're not right, they're useful. So we always need to account for that level of uncertainty. And in Bayesian statistics, when we provide estimates for our unknown parameter, we also get an associated uncertainty. So these are my main reasons for why I use Bayesian statistics. Let's start off with our first one. Our first Bayesian linear regression model is the most straightforward um, and it's the one that I, we always start with. We always start with a linear regression. So the goal is to examine the relationship between an input, in our case, time, and the response relative sea level, which is our y. And then we try to predict the response from our input variable by formulating a line of best fit. So our line of best fit is given by y equals alpha plus beta t plus epsilon. Alpha is our unknown intercept, beta is our unknown slope, and then we have this error vector. You don't need to worry too much about our error vector, but we have our, with this error vector is normally distributed with our standard deviation of sigma squared. So sigma squared, what this sigma squared is, it's um, a residual standard deviation, and this is what's unknown. So our residual standard deviation is how far our model is from the data. So this is a measure of how well our data is performing. Now we have three unknowns. We have our unknown uh, intercept, unknown slope, and unknown residual standard deviation. We need to set three different priors or three different guesses to these parameters. And if I knew did it, if I had another study done by somebody else, I could inform these priors with um, the previous study and use informative priors. But in my case, I didn't. I didn't know anything about these priors, so I keep kept the distributions just normal. Like if people, this is what a shape of a normal distribution would look like, simply with zero mean and standard deviation of 10. So they're just very random. This um, is my standard deviation, um, my residual standard deviation. And it looks a bit weird. This is actually a truncated T distribution. You don't need to worry about that. I just wanted to always make it positive, okay? Uh, before I show you the results, I'll just show you what data I'm using. So these are nine different data sites along the East Coast of the US. So you can see it's all the way up in, from Newfoundland, all the way down to Florida. And it's funny when I look at this map, all I think about now is which states are Democratic and which states are Republican. That's what I get from the last presidential election. So it helped me learn my states of the US. So these are the proxy data um, along the East Coast of the US. And um, this is what I've built my models on now because I'm just waiting for um, data to be collected for Ireland. So this is what the data looks like. You'll see that we have our Florida all the way up to Newfoundland. The black dots are the data and then we have these gray boxes. So these gray boxes are the uncertainty associated with taking that measurement. So you can see that they range from um, all the way back to a thousand. It seems weird saying minus a thousand for age, but if we think about it, this is CE common era, okay? So these are what my proxy data records look like for the East Coast of North America. And then how is my model doing? So let's show you my model. Okay, so this is my simple linear regression for relative sea level change along the east coast of US. The red line is my simple linear regression or my line of best fit. Straight away, I can see it's not doing a great job. 
it's not flexible, it's very rigid, it's not capturing the changes in sea level, it's doing pretty poor um, everywhere, every site, it's not doing well. And you might ask me, why wouldn't you just um, pick one site and get it working for one site? Well, the idea of Bayesian statistics is to use all the data to help inform the model. So if we look at Massachusetts, we don't have a lot of data for Massachusetts. And what we're doing is we're pulling from the other sites which have more data to make a better um, model estimate for my relative sea level change along the coast of the US. So simple linear regression, it's, it's really easy to do, but it's not doing a good job capturing the variability of sea level along our east coast of US. We need something more flexible. And this is where our Gaussian processes come into play. So I'll start off with a Gaussian distribution. People don't worry too much about it. There's a lot of stats words here, but Gaussian distribution is a probability distribution. And this is what it looks like. You have a mean and you have a variance or a standard deviation sigma. Another way we call it is a normal distribution or a bell-shaped curve. And I think everybody have heard about the bell-shaped curve, especially from the leave insert. You have to be within the bell-shaped curve. Um, so that's what I always remember is that a Gaussian distribution is the same as saying a bell-shaped curve. And this was developed by a German mathematician called Carl Friedrich Gauss in 1809 which for context is about the same period Netflix's Bridgerton was set in, for those of you who are um, obsessed like I am with that series. So Gaussian distributions are extremely useful and really powerful for examining trends of data. That being said, we now need to generalize multiple Gaussian distributions to form a Gaussian process. What does that mean? Instead of having one Gaussian distribution, now we're gonna have multiple ones to form a Gaussian process. Another way of saying that is that it's a multivariate normal distribution. And what I mean by multivariate simply is multiple variables. So instead of estimating just our mean, we're going to have to estimate our mean function. And then our covariance is now going to be a function. So each random variable is now normally distributed. And when they join together, they'll have a Gaussian distribution. So our mean is going to be a function of our input and our covariance is going to be a function of our inputs. So this case for our covariance function, our input variance that are in close proximity. So if things are close together, the response variables are more correlated. So if you have, let's say two data sets that are close together, you know that realistically they should be more related comparison to let's say if you have two sites really far away, they won't be as related, okay? So this is simply our Gaussian processes. Then you may ask, why? Why use Gaussian processes for um, modeling rates of sea level change? Well, the first advantage is that it is non-parametric. What does that mean? Well, non-parametric means that it makes no assumptions. Only the data informs the structure. So we're not forcing it into a specific model. And this is really useful um, for our relative sea level data. The second advantage is that GPs are flexible and they can give estimates for relative sea level change for let's say years we didn't have data. The third advantage is that it is a stochastic process. I always struggle with that word, stochastic process, meaning the random variables it describes depend on time and or space. And this is extremely important when we're examining rates of sea level change in space and time. And the last advantage for using a Gaussian process is that they're extendable, which is really useful when we're trying to examine, let's say, our different components or our different drivers that cause relative sea level change. So I hope you agree with me that my Gaussian processes are extremely useful for estimating rates of sea level change. 
I'm just going to show you my results for my first set of points. So I'm using the same data set as the previous model. So I'm using my nine sites along the east coast of the US. And this is what it's looking like. We have our temporal Gaussian process. All that means is that it's a Gaussian process in just time. We have our nine different sites again. And you might see in Florida that there's sort of this gray area. Well, this gray area is a 95% credible interval. That means that our model actually, it could be here, it could be a little bit higher, it could be a little bit lower. And this middle red line is our middle median or mean value, okay? Straight away, I can see it's a lot more flexible. It's capturing more the variability of the data um, and it's doing a better job at examining the trends of relative sea level change. Um, but I still think it could do better. I still think we could um, improve this and capture more of the variability. And this is where our spatial temporal Gaussian processes come into play. And yes, the titles are getting longer and more of a mouthful to say. Sea level, we know, evolves over time, but sea level is not uniform across the globe. Therefore, we need to a way to examine how sea level changes in both time and space. This is where our spatial, temporal, Gaussian process models come into play because they are extremely useful at providing insights into RSL and rates of RSL change at any arbitrary point in space and time. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we're getting more complex um, and that our mean function is now going to depend on time and space and a covariance function is going to be a product of a temporal function and a spatial function. That all that means is it's going to depend on time and space as well. So now we're going to have to estimate more parameters but is there a payoff? Is there a good reason why we're doing this? And this is what I lead on to. Why is spatial temporal Gaussian processes useful for examining relative sea level change? Well, the first advantage is that we know sea level changes over time and space. And a Gaussian process is extendable, which allows us to examine both components of time and space. Second advantage is that spatial temporal Gaussian processes can inform sea level in sites based on their proximity in time and space. So if you look at something that's close together, we can infer what the spatial temporal Gaussian process should look like. The third advantage will be spatial temporal Gaussian processes are useful as they provide insight into relative sea level change for sites without data. And this is a real big problem. We don't have a lot of data the further we go back. So models like this are extremely useful for examining sea level change. And the final advantage would be a Gaussian process in space and time gives you estimates for multiple sites or multiple locations. So when we are examining, let's say, our global mean sea level, which I talked about at the very start, we can do this using a spatial temporal Gaussian process. So these are my four advantages for using my Gaussian process. And now I'm going to show you the plot of my result. And I hope that you can agree with me that these models are doing a better job at examining our sea level, our relative sea level change. So here we go. Here is my result. This is a spatial temporal Gaussian process for data along the east coast of the US. We can see that straight away, maybe a few more sites. What's happening? You have more sites. Well, my model has identified that in my previous studies that, let's say, Newfoundland, there's actually two sites in Newfoundland. Previously, we were looking at GPs in just time. So we wanted to get a, um, a record that went back in time. So 
there are different ways that we can look at this. We can either look further back in time or we can look of spatially. We can see how the sea level has changed spatially. But here I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do both. I'm trying to look back in time as far as I can, but also look back at sea level spatially. And you can see that I'm doing a lot better here. Look at Newfoundland. It's capturing that variability, that change in the sea level trend. Look at Florida, it's doing a lot better and it's bridging the gaps where we don't have the data. But one thing that's jumping out at me straight away is that every single site has relative sea level increasing. So this hopefully will highlight that climate change is happening and our relative sea level is increasing in most locations around the globe. So I'm going to finish up with a quick summary of what I've done. I have know I've inundated you with information today um, and I hope I, you take away something from this. So the first thing we discussed was how sea level was a powerful example of climate change. And I think I've highlighted this to you use my three different models. The second thing I showed you was about relative sea level change and I gave a definition for the difference between sea level and the Earth's sediment surface. The third thing I showed you was the different ways we collected data and how our proxy records are going to provide a long-term relative sea level change data. So this is when I'm going to be collaborating with Tr Trinity College Dublin to try and bridge the gap in the Irish historical sea level change. The next thing I showed you was my statistics, my Bayesian linear regression, and I highlighted how it does not capture the variability of relative sea level change along North America's east coast. The next thing I talked about was my Gaussian processes, and I highlighted how they're flexible and they're extremely useful for examining sea level in both time and space. And they didn't make any assumptions, they let the data determine the shape of the model. And finally, I showed you my spatial temporal Gaussian process, my big mouthful of a model, and I demonstrated how relative sea level change along North America's Atlantic coast is the highest it has been in 15 centuries. And that's pretty much it for me today. And there is my references if people wanted to see. I just wanted to say thank you for letting me talk and if anybody has any questions to fire away. So thank you. May if I just see um, one question there from Sheena yeah. in the chat. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I can't see the chat. Oh, sorry. So she's <laughs> saying, um, could I ask about the proxy records? What is the accuracy? Uh, sorry, you might have mentioned this, my little ones. Okay. So, yeah. So she's just wondering what, um, what the proxy records would you have? So, uh, so the proxy records, when we are collecting the data from the proxy records, we are um, usually the accuracy is, it depends on we obtain the age estimates from radiocarbon dating. So we have to account for that uncertainty, but there's also uncertainty in um, the height. So when we take these cores, we're taking um, sedimentation, we're taking the height of it. So the accuracy is probably one or two um, millimeters, but it depends on the different locations. And I'm not the strongest when it comes to how to collect the salt marshes. This is where my collaborators in Trinity are extremely good at this. Um, and they're always working to improve these accuracy in these um, data collections. But at the moment, they're doing a pretty good job because um, further you go back, it's very hard to identify exactly where these changes in sea level occur. I hope that answered. I'm not the strongest when it comes to the data side of it, but um, yeah. I hope that answered a little bit. And um, I just see another question here from Kevin Galligan. Um, 
is the projected sea level rise for Ireland, example, Ireland of Hoth, a worst case scenario? So these uh, projections are dependent on, I'm actually not sure which scenario they were looking at. I remember at the start of my talk, I discussed about these different scenarios, the worst and the best case scenario. Um, I think it probably is the worst case scenario in the 19, in 2050, I hope it is. Um, but I'm not entirely sure if it's the high emission scenario or it's the low, it could be a mixture of them both. So I hope that um, answers your question. He says yes. <laughs> um, I'm just seeing something here from Margaret Kenny. Uh, very interesting in the news today, prices of property in Miami were being reported. Already the wealthy informed are taking heed and poor individuals are further disadvantaged. Data will become more relevant socially. Um, and then from Dara, well done Maeve, lovely maps. Are these spatial models very, now, <laughs> my pronunciation won't be. So are these spatial models very computational intense? Do you have any tips for, for running such big models? Um, yeah, yes, thanks Dara. Um, yes, they are um, very intense. Um, I with these Gaussian processes, they take a long time to run. So sometimes you'd be talking maybe um, 20 or maybe a couple of hours or at a minimum. So usually when I use my data, Dara, I usually um, normalize everything to reduce the size of something. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time it's just patience and leaving them run because at the moment that's that's the best results I'm getting. So yeah. We get there. <laughs> do, do you want me to read that question from Shana? Yeah, or? I just seen it there. Yeah. Um, so, is there a specific environmental driver in Florida? So, yes. Um, so, Florida is. Um, where it's situated, it's a, if we think about what I was talking about, the different drivers for relative sea level change. So um, we have these four or five different drivers for relative sea level change. And at the moment in Florida, what Florida is, is feeling is that you have, um, they used to have this Laurentide ice sheet. So the Laurentide ice sheet was um, across all North America and it was causing this isostatic depression as I was talking about. So the relative sea level actually appeared to be higher when this ice sheet was um, lying on top of this, the plate because the plate was squished down. And since that has melted, there's sort of this rebounding effect happening. And the further you are away from this rebound of the effect, the, the, more, the more you're seeing this sort of uh, relative sea level change. So this is why in Florida is further away from the ice sheet and this is why it's having um, a different driver than other parts of the US. It's also got to do with data as well. Um, so when you're looking at different sites along the east coast of the US, there is very different sort of um, marsh conditions um, that can impact how we how well we can get sort of trends and stuff so that would be another reason why Florida might look a little bit different um but yeah it's 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 a little bit worrying to see how these are these are, rises are happening but um it's it's good that we're seeing it now and we can make changes for the future yeah great I'm not sure if there's any more questions. I don't see any more coming in. Oh, um, Ho Chan, do you have an equivalent analysis for sea level rise in Japan? I heard for years that they have substantial plan to in place to prepare for it, but I've never actually had a chance to have a look at the analysis. I don't have an analysis of sea level rise in Japan. It's definitely there. I know one of the our group was actually looking at sea level rise in Japan. In um, he was looking at tidal gauge data 
Um, Sam, Sam has been working on that at the moment. Um, Japan is really influenced by tectonic factors. So it would be something different than what I'm looking at. Um, so tectonic factors is something we don't worry about. So I don't have much experience in at the moment, but yeah, there's definitely been a lot of analysis in Japan and Japan, Japan will be influenced hugely by rises in sea level as we can probably guess. So yeah, it's definitely out there. I don't have a reference for it, Ho-chan, but um, I can talk to you about it again if you want. Great. Great. So I don't think anybody else has any more questions. That seems clear, Maeve, I think. I'm yeah. sure anybody might come back to you with burning issues yeah. anyway afterwards. Um, great, so I'll stop sharing my screen and just say thank you for the, the team and Minute Library, it was fantastic. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll see you all soon, fingers crossed. <laughs>